thank you for this excellent program. I've been able to catch a good portion of it, both from here and also from the YouTube side. Um, what a perfect thing. And just to piggyback, piggyback off of what you just said, now that we all understand exactly everything about coagulation, it's a perfect time to talk about, uh, talk about Quantra and hemasonics and what we do. So I'll share my screen. Um, if I may, let's see if got this. That. Does everything look okay? Yeah, it does now. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So this is a, a 10 minute, pretty much a fast overview. And when I got the note from the Sanibel uh, people, and by the way, thank you to Susan and Brian and Ty and everybody involved uh, for contacting us regarding this meeting, I thought about what is it that we want to get uh, known about hemasonics and about the Quantra. Um, and, and that it, thought about it, and it, actually that is it. Um, uh, I've been in and associated with coagulation, uh, specifically whole blood, blood viscoelastic testing uh, of coagulation for a greater portion of my career. And uh, one thing I've noticed is that, you know, often there are two brand names associated with that um, particular technology. Uh, there are actually three brand names associated with that particular technology and Quantra is one of those three. So if nothing else from today, uh, I'd like to make sure that everybody out there knows that when doing your due diligence um, in the name of uh, accessing what's available on the market to you, take a look uh, as you look at um, my competitors, which I think you all know who they are. I won't mention them by name out of respect. Um, but please take also a look at Quantra. Um, so, let's see, I have a bit of a, what was my, okay. Um, so what is the issue, right? Um, when a patient is bleeding, um, we need to, clinical teams need to make really fast decisions about how to treat those patients. Because uh, as we all know, and if we think about coagulation and coagulopathy, especially as a patient bleeds, that coagulation profile is changing really by the second, you know, if not by the minute uh, and second. So it's very important to, to understand exactly what's happening in as close to real time as possible. Uh, this is the argument for speed, uh, really, in, in viscoelastic um, hemostasis assays. We know about transfusions. We know that they can uh, increase infection, morbidity, length of stay. These are well documented, right? The benefits of, of viscoelastic testing and how they can affect outcomes, how they can affect overall cost associated with blood products are well known. Um, what we don't have is 100% standard of care compliance across the world, if you will, right? I mean, if so why not? That's the question, right? Why not? Um, you know, one of those uh, challenges that we set out to, to solve um, was really the ease of use and interpretation piece, right? So um, again, having been in this area for a long time, uh, I understand that education and interpretation is one of the biggest challenges. Um, and as such, communication of results to one another within the clinical teams, to the blood bank, to the laboratory, point of care coordination, and of course, surgeon, anesthesiologist, perfusionist. Uh, everyone needs to be in line and understanding the same thing and speaking the same language. Uh, these are one of the, the greatest challenges. Um, this is the Quantra. Um, it's novel, it's, uh, it's new, it's patented, um, and it's indicated for point of care use. Um, the, the cartridge that's available in the United States, which is the Q Plus cartridge, uh, it says they're FDA de novo. It's not a standard 510K approval. It's actually a de novo approval, which I won't go too far into. It only means that uh, it is in a class by itself, is available for cardiac surgery, cardiovascular surgery, major ortho surgery, and most recently, coagulopathy, coagula, coagulopathy uh, suspected due to COVID-19 uh, in hospitalized patients. And that was per the January 2021 FDA guidance. Uh, we have, in case there are people in Europe, uh, Japan, Australia, um, watching now, we have another cartridge that is indicated for trauma, liver, and obstetric in those markets, not in the United States yet. 
the technology is based on SEER. Okay, SEER is a proprietary technology that means sonic estimation and elasticity via, via resonance. Um, in, in essence, uh, what happens within the cartridge, completely closed cartridge within the Quantra, is a high frequency ultrasound pulse hits the blood in a completely closed bell shaped well. Um, it basically vibrates that sample at ultrasonic frequency over time, uh, and it measures that response and plots it on a curve, plots a shear modulus direct measurement in hectopascals of that blood's physical viscoelastic property. Okay, so this is a departure really from what is available out there as the Quantra measures directly the viscoelastic property in terms that perhaps a uh, physicist might use or a mechanical engineer. Um, as far as using the device itself, uh, simple blue top, 3-2 citrate, um, 2.7 mil. Um, it requires a couple of scans, one of the patient, one of the cartridge. You basically push it in, push in the cartridge, cartridge which is room temperature stable, push down the sample, hit the start button. That is it. Um, per the customers that we have, uh, this is one of the key advantages to having it at the point of care, the absolute ease of use and room temperature stability uh, of the system. Um, also, you know, it doesn't hurt that it's completely closed, uh, especially in the world and, and heightened sensitivity to uh, potentially infectious agents, traveling samples, et cetera, uh, that does help as well. Um, and in less than 15 minutes, less than or equal to 15 minutes, but typically 11 to 13 minutes, you have final actionable results. And over the course of the next few slides, I'll tell you how to read them. Um, we did a, uh, did a study, actually it was required by FDA to prove that this could be indicated for point of care use. And that study um, included a number of individuals and we gave them basically a test. We gave them 30 minutes of Quantra interpretation training and then a test. And then after 30 minutes of training, we were able to determine that 95% proficiency in interpretation could be achieved. Uh, so we had felt that we met that goal and FDA did as well. And so across, we have here the, the dials. Okay, this is the primary display of the Quantra. And I'll very simply say, and I'll say again, across the top, we're looking at the clot onset. Okay, clotting times, if you will. CT stands for clotting times. Okay, we'll go into more detail. Across the bottom, we're looking about at clot quality, which we call stiffness. Okay, so in, in each case, you see an S that stands for stiffness, clot stiffness, platelet, clot stiffness, fibrinogen, clot stiffness. Okay, so that's it. We're looking at that time to onset at the top. We're looking at quality on the bottom, meaning how well does the clot start? And then how well does the clot basically stay together and hold back the blood? This is the key, right? The stiffness is the key, the robustness, if you will, of the clot. Um, these green bars that you see are our reference ranges. The device comes with integrated default normal reference ranges based on a study uh, in the United States, multi-center, 120 normal healthies. Okay, so what is a normal healthy? Exactly, right? It is a reference range, a range of reference. It is not the end all be all, of course, we know this. Um, you know, nothing is normal about a patient going through surgery. So it provides some guidance. Um, however, um, and it, it does give you the result, there it is in hectopascals, that's what HPA stands for again, a direct measurement of the viscosity or the physical property of that blood. And it puts a, a marker on the graph or on the dial, if you will, to show you about where it is in terms of bottom of the reference range, top of the reference range, off the reference range. For example, here, we're seeing an, a result which is way higher than the reference range. And it turns the answer yellow. It gives you an indication that something's up that you should probably pay attention. Again, okay, clock time across the top row. Um, here, we're just looking at the top of the screen and CTH, I'll start with CTH. Then that actually is the second bullet, but I'll start because it's left to right and that's how I read. CTH in seconds is the clot time with heparinase. So heparin is reversed. So imagine, for example, this is from a patient who has just received protamine to reverse 
reverse the heparin after having uh, CV surgery and coming off pump. Okay, this is protamine after protamine has been uh, administered. And, and we can see that that CTH with the heparin reversed is the top end of normal range, relatively regular. If we read across, now we're looking at the CT. That means clot time. That is heparin sensitive. Okay, so now we see a difference between the onset time of a heparin sensitive and a heparin insensitive. So then we can make the assessment by just knowing what we know, everything we need to know about coagulation from the previous talk, that this is a low range, as was mentioned in the previous talk, which, which may be insensitive by, uh, to the ACT. The ACT may be insensitive to it uh, because it is in a low range of residual heparin, perhaps not enough protamine. Um, and then we, we read across to the CTR. The CTR means clot time ratio. And it is absolutely simplifies the, this whole thing I just said in that anything over 1.4 indicates a likelihood for residual heparin. So this is actually making a ratio between CT and CTH. It's giving a result of 2.6, which indicates residual heparin. This person would need some more protamine as a first line, right? Before we're even going to worry about um, factors or platelets or fibrinogen. Not that we can't get that information, however. On the bottom row, we have our clot stiffness parameters. Okay, across the bottom from left to right, we have clot stiffness. This is the overall clot stiffness. This is the platelet contribution, the fibrinogen contribution combined, right? This is the red cells. This is the functional ability of the whole clot to to hold back blood, if you will, or its, its strength, its power. Moving across, we have then the PCS, that is the platelet contribution, okay? Following that, FCS is the fibrinogen contribution. So essentially what we're looking at across the bottom is the total of the clot, that's platelets and fibrinogen relative to one another. And remember, they have functional interactions with one another, with one another that um, increase the stiffness of that clotting. And then we're looking at the isolated components, the platelet contribution and the fibrinogen contribution as they exist relative to one another. Now, what I mentioned a little bit earlier is that these are all heparin insensitive. So whether you're testing someone preoperatively that was on a drip, whether you are on pump specifically or post pump uh, after protamine with a potential for residual heparin, you will still get accurate and adequate answers from your CS, PCS, and FCS. So you'll have also an idea as to what the fibrinogen component looks like, the platelet component looks like, and then also, of course, the overall stiffness looks like if and once that heparin is fully reversed. Point being, if heparin is still on board, or let's say on pump, and you notice that the platelet contribution is I like to say my, my term falling off the floor, right? It would give the clinician a really good idea and you as the person communicating to the clinician, a really good idea to make a note that we may have a problem with platelets, okay? So if it's possible to get some in the room, it might be a good idea. Of course, that's, that's up to the clinical decision makers, but communication is key. Um, other options, as you see across the left-hand side of the screen, there are these, there's some little squares and you can click on those squares. This is all touch screen, of course. Um, welcome to 20, whatever, 1989. So this is uh, all touch screen. Welcome to 2021. Um, you can click the little curves button and you can see curves. So this is basically the half, half of a drawing of what you would consider a classical uh, viscoelastic drawing from a Tegra Rotem. Uh, but it's it's the top half. I mean, it's not it's just not mirrored as is sometimes done via software with some other technologies. Um, but it's essentially the same thing. Um, you can see the stiffness in hectopascals up on the up on the axis, and you can see time in seconds here, and you can see that the results are all output right there on the right hand bar. If you like, you can also this is actually one of my favorite features. Uh, click on the trends button. And this is, you know, later in the case, the, the patient has been tested a number of times. Maybe it's a CV surgery and they've, they've gone off on pump, they've gone off pump, they've been treated maybe once and you're testing again. You can see that 
that patient trend. I mean, how did they start? What is their baseline? This is very important, and it's it's really um, it really relates to to what I said before. A normal is not. We, we can't rely on everybody to be normal on, on day one and fall into the what is average category. Um, everybody's an individual and everybody's different. So getting that baseline is, is hugely important and understanding where they were when pre-incision and where you need to get them back to, um, especially if there's bleeding or only if there's bleeding um, is key of key importance. So uh, tomorrow, I say more on this tomorrow at 440, um, tomorrow, we're hosting a really nice talk with Marcelo Pizzo, uh, Director of Perfusion at um, Mount Sinai Medical Center from Miami. Uh, he will give an overview of his impressions from a perfusionist perspective of the Quantra that they've been using for a little more than a year now, um, as well as go through some cases and a specifically and, and particularly interesting case uh, I found uh, where the patient was anything but normal. So very cool. Uh, that's tomorrow at 440. Please uh, take a note, join us. That would be great. Right. Jeff, um, thank you very much. We're absolutely. going to look forward to um, yep. looking forward to your virtual booth tomorrow. Um, it is on the website. Again, follow the website. Thank you, Jeff, for your presentation. <laughs> we look forward to hearing more about your product. And I look forward to more. Uh, this is right up my alley. Thank you. Thank you, Ty. I appreciate that. And apologies for going a little long. I had set my timer and apparently didn't didn't let me know. So